So we're back to this series on self-talk. And for the next couple of months, we've said this in the last few weeks, that we're addressing a prevalence of you know, mental health and global health issues that are prevalent to first world, like the United States. And you know, what we say to ourselves about ourselves and others, and even about what we say to ourselves about the world and how we orient our lives as a result of these beliefs that we hold on to. And we're tackling basically 15 distortions and 18 stigmas. Um, stigmas. And um, one of the things that we're trying to establish in the next few months is how these things and issues play out these lenses of the way we look at ourselves and how we see others and even the world, how this is affecting us in a negative way. And um, today, let's move down. I want to talk about just again, um, I mean, every week I'm researching these things, but you know, just a, a, a frightening and terrifying reality about if we don't get this mental health epidemic and really grasp it and understand what this is going to do in the next 30 years. A lot of us will fall behind and not be able to really become everything that God calls us to be. How many people want to be everything God calls you to be? Raise your hands. Everything, I mean, we're talking about an, a lens of optimization, a lens where we're talking about human flourishing. We're talking about you walking into the narrative, the destiny that God has for your life. And if you're not feeling well and you're feeling disconnected, how can you walk in that destiny? You can't. Because for a lot of people in the States, what they're thinking is, I just want to feel normative. I just want to not feel disconnected. I just want to not have these thoughts come up every second I'm with others. Not feel depressed about the future. Not just anxious about things I can't control. And so if normity is the goal, then that's a, you know, it's, it's a net zero neutral game. You're not getting any gains. Like for some of those of you here to go to the gym, to all, it's all about the gains, they say. I have no idea what that means. I haven't worked out for a decade. But, you know, um, but that's what they're talking. We're talking about ways to move forward in life. And so we have to address this. The mental health crisis could cost the world 16 trillion. Tell someone 16 trillion by 2030. Forget about becoming trillionaires like Apple and Amazon becoming worth a market cap of, of a trillion. We're talking about 30, 16 trillion globally by 2030, not just using counselors and through health insurance. We're talking about the loss of productivity. We're talking about the loss of optimization. Every shape that God has gifted you with, all the talents and gifts, some of you are artists. Some of you are people in the medicine. Some of you are, have different abilities. We're talking about the loss of productivity and what the potential that could be gone. And we're talking about Harvard Medical School just released this record uh, report. We're talking about $16 trillion of lo net loss. And uh, they, they've said, particularly this week, that this is an epidemic that no global network no government, no sovereign state is addressing fast enough. Meaning, there is dam under the water, and the water is bleeding in, and we don't know what to do. And so the church, I believe, has to get ahead of this first. And so if you, let me give you a bit of advice. You want to make money, go into this. Mental health, biotech, technology, anything to do with depression, anxiety. Uh, develop a pill, I don't know, pharmaceutical company. We're talking about this being the next whale. This, if you talk about it, the, the gaping hole, the need of humanity in the next 50 years, this is the frontier. And so this is why we're here and why we're addressing it. So you can get ahead. And, and work on yourself, how you view yourself, how you view, your, you know, view others and the world. And we want you to become leaders in, in your spheres of influence. Become healthy, become whole. Amen? And that's why we're addressing this. So today we're going to address uh, uh, another distortion, which is, let's turn here, um, called jumping to conclusions. How many people here jump to conclusions a lot in your life? 
You're just like, you know, you get a text, you're dating someone, you get a text and they say, it's over. And then, you know, you can picture the girl or the guy be like, what? I can't believe what? You're going to end our relationship over a text? I can't believe you. You're so ungrateful. I bought you dinner. I was, you know, I, I made you, you know, clothes, whatever. I did your laundry. I even, you know, and then the person goes, no, the movie's over. And you're like, oh, how was the movie? <laughs> I mean, we jump to conclusions about how people look at us on the street or even at church. That person, I know for a fact they don't like me. Can you prove that empirically? How, how do you know? I just know these things. I mean, we have people say this all the time. I just know these things. Trust me without any evidence. I just know that this person doesn't like me. Or someone will say, they'll do fortune telling. I know what's going to happen. No, you don't. Yes, I do. I feel it. It's going to be bad. It's going to be terrible. So there's, there's a form of mind reading. Apparently, you're a superhero. Like Kanye says, he's a superhero. He's, you know, there's no. There's no superheroes, except in the Marvel Universe, and the DC Universe, whatever comics you want to read. In real life, there are no, there, there's no such things. But we jump to conclusions. So this says, I got 99 problems. 86 of them are completely made up scenarios in my head that I'm stressing about absolutely for no logical reason. And this is us. And this, this distortion of jumping to conclusions is one of the most hurtful things in relationships where you misunderstand the other because of the way you interpret what they're saying or their intentions toward you without slowing down and evaluating and looking at the evidence. Okay, No one is omniscient. You do not know everything. But some of you think you're God. Right? No, I know these things. Dr. Tim, I'm different from other people. I just know these things. You sound crazier by the moment. I just know these things. And, and so this struggle is very hurtful for relationships, but it also costs in businesses tons of money because you, you think you hired the right person, but you were wrong because you judge by outer appearances what's on paper, and you jump to conclusions about what they can achieve, and you were wrong, and you miss certain things. So this applies to every sector. Personal relationships, business, occupation, everything. So let me show you an example of jumping to conclusions on Twitter. So they put this up on Twitter. And they saw all these children in, in, in the middle of America on their knees, looking like they're praying. And so someone tweets, American middle school caught forcing students to do Muslim prayers five times a day. Time to revoke funding, right? And if you read after, this is what uh, uh, someone responded to this tweet. This is what uh, decades of reject rejecting Jesus Christ has done to this nation, and the children are worshiping Satan. This is a right-wing Christian that we get flagged for in New York all the time. Okay, if you're a seeker, please, we're not like these folks. We all have crazy uncles that say things that we don't agree with and cringe when they talk. Christianity is the same. So, but look, let's go down. And, um, but someone says, it's a tornado drill. The person says, next time I'll research before sending, sorry. <laughs> and you laugh at this. Tell someone, I want you to point to them and go, you do this every day. You, you read this thing, and you're like, that person's nuts. That person's crazy. So are you and me. We do it. I can't believe you. I, I can't believe you thought this. You did this. And, and the thing is, we're jumping to conclusion. We're jumping, hopping. A everyone here, we're all jumpers. Not bungee jumping, not out of a plane. Well, some of you are crazy enough to do that. Jump out. You're with your jumpers. You jump to conclusions. We jump to conclusions a lot, and this hurts relationships. We have to learn to stop the jumping. Okay? Maybe we should start crawling toward the evidence around us and stop to think for a moment and go, hey, what, what's, what is really going on? This is faulty thinking. right? 
So let's move to this text. And Proverbs is, is a book of wisdom by Solomon, who supposedly is, by a biblical proclamation and claim, that he was the wisest man in his time. And historically, there is proof of other kingdoms and other kings and, and um, patriarchs that would come to see Solomon for wisdom. And so I would say in the wisdom literature in the Bible, this is good wisdom to listen to. And this is Eugene Peterson's professor at Regent College's version translation of the Bible. And in verse 8, he says, read it with me. Don't what? There may be what? A perfectly what? For what you just saw. Right? Don't jump to conclusions. So what is the distortion here? Clearly the distortion is what? And of the 15, this is one. Let's put it up. So remember distortion, then reality, and then the good news of the gospel. So the distortion or the schema is I just know what others are thinking about me even without talking to them. And you're like, that's crazy. Well, <laughs> That's what we do a lot in practice. Maybe not in theory, but in practice. For example, this mind reading gift some of us have. My wife has this gift, or she thinks, and so do I sometimes in our relationship. But I'm not going to use my wife as an example because I, I want to be on my good behavior today. So I'm going to choose, I'm going to pick on other people. Like, uh, I'm going to pick on the podcast. The podcast. <laughs> Danny and Joe. And then I just want to just want to give you uh, major uh, publications like um, CBN and CT. A lot of them are beginning to listen to the podcast, so please be on your best behavior. Please don't use profanity, or I will get massive amount of emails if we're Christian denomination or not. Okay. So anyway, so in the in the middle of the podcast, when we launch the podcast and it's growing and people are benefiting from the podcast that we started, um, I just text. Joe and Danny and said, guys, I would like to meet you guys this Sunday over lunch about the podcast. I think you guys are doing a great job. And they all put thumbs up on the text. <laughs> great. I can say, I'll see you there. And then when we're going to lunch, they go, what we do wrong? <laughs> Joe's like, are we getting fired? Danny's like, am I getting replaced? What is, this, what is the reason you want to have lunch? We know why you want to have lunch with us. You think we're stupid. <laughs> yeah. I said, no. I think you guys are doing a great job. I just wanted to buy you Korean barbecue. No, no, you didn't. Mm -mm. There's something, there's definitely something wrong we're in trouble of some sort. We, we said something. I'm sorry. You know, I don't know all the theology. Or, you know, uh, here. And they thought of 18 different reasons why. Or like that Netflix show, 13 reasons why they should be cut. Suicide. Right? I mean, they, they, were, they, they had a distorted view of what I wanted to meet with them. I, just, I mean, I don't know why some people, every time I text them, hey, do you want to have lunch? What did I do wrong? <laughs> I just want to have lunch. I'm not the police. I'm not the bad policeman. But, but this is how they felt. But, but it was all about Korean barbecue and about optimizing the podcast, a conversation around this. But they what? Jumped to conclusions. They saw me as a negative person, which I'm not. I'm the most optimistic person there is. But, but that's, so a lot of times when people want to talk to us, or if my wife says we need to talk, I'm like, oh, great. Something, some, this is, here goes three, four hours about what I've done wrong or something. My intentions were wrong. But sometimes my wife goes, I need to talk to you on text. And that's all she says. And I'm like, for eight hours, I'm like, what does she want to talk about? I can't write this article. What and I'm and then going over my mind. And, and, you know, anxiety, depression, all of that, all those emotions. I'm like, uh, did I not take out the trash? No, I did that. I, I put the dishwasher I think I put it in. I did some of the laundry. Oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. I didn't dry the laundry. <laughs> Here's a reprimand coming. Here's a reprimand coming. You know. And all she wanted to say was, when I talked to her, I'm like, hey, what's up? So we're waiting for dinner. Where are we going? <laughs> I'm like, why couldn't you ask that question? What do you want to eat for dinner? Why do you say we got to talk about something? 
What, what kind of text is that? Do you have an etiquette in texting? Why don't you just call me? Don't text me anymore. What is wrong with you? But this anxiety we feel a lot of times about, about what other people are thinking or feeling is completely off base. And so all of you in this room, they go, I, I, but I'm special. Yes, you are. OK? OK, anyone who believes this, that they have this power, you don't. OK? You have to gather information. We have to stop jumping to conclusions. It is, mind reading is one of the most annoying things in relationships. We have to stop it. This distortion is very painful to deal with. Because if you have no empirical evidence and not all the evidence, maybe the best thing to do is ask about a conversation rather than jumping. OK, so that's the distortion. What's the reality? Read it with me. Jumping to what? Without what? All the evidence is what? Simply? It's, fa it's simply faulty reasoning. So this is part of the cognitive distortion schema. It's that a lot of us are building our relationships on what? Say it with me. Again, what? Faulty what? Reasoning. And I'm sure a lot of you, if you're in relationships, that's what you fight about. What? It doesn't make any sense. It's about the foundation of a lot of our relationships, and that's why our relationships are poor or suffering, because a lot of our base is based on, you know, anecdotal, faulty thinking. Because jumping to judgments without all the evidence is simply faulty reasoning. So there's mind reading, but there's also labeling. Well, there's also fortune telling, but I'll go into that later. But there's labeling. You know, you think you have few experiences, so therefore you make a judgment. I know these type of people. You know that person right there? This is where gossip is all based on, on this form of judgments, jumping to judgments. You see that person? That person is like this or like that. And I do this all the time. And I didn't know I, do, I, I did it until recently. Well, I do it a lot, actually. And like, for example, I would meet people. And uh, you know, I'm going to these. Uh, conferences and speaking, and they're very prominent people, but they don't look prominent to me. Because in my mind, I think they're going to look like, you know, like someone from the movies, like Brad Pitt or something, you know, or you know, they're going to be glamorous. Or even different shades of gray, or dif different types of people. But you know what they look like? They look just like you people. <laughs> I'm passing by someone. You know, they're the CEO of that or this. And then and one time, the most embarrassing thing happened at Cheesecake. We're having a dinner before the conference. And then all, they invited all the keynotes and all the people. And we're all there and talking, you know. And I'm talking clearly to a person that I knew that was the founder of the Bible app, right? Almost 500 million downloads. I'm like, whoa, Bobby, you're so cool. You know, and he's like, I know. Check out my muscles. I don't know, I don't know what's going on with these uh, famous tech guys, but they're all working out. Like, they're jacked up now. And all they do is wear t-shirts and sneakers. And I'm like looking like an idiot like in a suit. I'm like, why did I do this? And then, and then I'm supposed to meet the, the, the new director of partnerships at Facebook, Faith Partnerships. And I'm thinking, you know, Silicon Valley. I'm thinking, you know, um, you know, this blonde, somewhere 30 years old, Ivy League looking woman. You know, her name is Nona. And I'm just like, I was like, dude, where, where's Nona? Then, what I, then they, they introduced me to Nona, and I'm so glad I didn't open my mouth. Because she was a 6'2 African American woman that looked like, you know, someone in the WNBA. You know? And she was like in a jumpsuit, with Nike jumpsuit, with like flashy sneakers. Uh, th and this is Nona. I was like, oh, hi. I was thinking, I was completely thinking of someone white and blonde hair. And so when I met her, I was like, shocked. And, and I'm so glad I didn't say anything. Because in my mind, I, I mean, okay, so, so look at my own distortions. You see how vulnerable I'm being here? 
Look at this. Look at this. And this is the, it's one of the highest levels. I'm just like, you know, I'm thinking, what is a, a, what is a director at a Facebook supposed to look like? There's no description of race in the CV. We only accept blonde people from Silicon Valley that are Ivy trained. No, they're, I mean, that's what I think that person would be. Because I have what? I have labeling. I label someone in the chair or race. And this is also part of why racism exists and why prejudice exists and, and why we think certain things about people because we have assumptions, presuppositions about others. Yeah? How embarrassing is that? But we all do it. You know? Some, we, some people we think they look smart. Just like, you know, when we play basketball and, and, and I see a 6'6 six, six black guy, you know, with all the Jordan gear, with the Nike logo, you know, Jordan gear, and then I pick him on my team and he sucks. I'm so disappointed at him. I'm like, bro. I don't deceive people like this. Come on, like Urkel glasses or something. Don't, and then, and what, what am I? I'm projecting my own what? Labeling again. And this is what we do a lot. We jump to conclusions about how people should be and how people should act and how people you know, should perform based on my perceptions. But that's not reality, is it? So when, we're, when we jump to judgments, when we jump to judgments like this, it not only hurts our relationships, but it also hurts what? Society in general. It hurts what? Unity and civility. And I mean, do we need to talk about labeling today in our political atmosphere of how we label people, scapegoat people, how we target certain type of people? This is all form of labeling and jumping to conclusions. And so we have to, what? The Proverbs is telling us what? Don't jump to conclusions. There may be a perfectly good explanation for what you just saw. Because Nona was offered the Facebook, Facebook job, not even applying. They found her. Facebook literally hired a headhunter and hunted her down. Because they felt like she was the perfect person for this role. She's the only employee in Facebook history that's not living in Silicon Valley because she's also a pastor in Florida with her husband. A Pentecostal church out of the norms. And so a lot of, uh, and I'm speaking to the Christians in this room, okay? How many Christians in this room? Okay, I know you. All right. Some of you think you, you, you divide uh, your, your walk with God with your secular job. And you go, well, there's a dichotomy between it. But let me tell you, the world doesn't look at it that way. What it means to be congruent and genuine in your walk with God and faith has everything, has really appeal to companies like Facebook, Google. I know them and I've seen it recently. They, they went to her and said, we want you to work for us. And she hung up on them because she, it was, she thought it was a prank call. But it happened to be real. They, they went after her. So there is not a dichotomy. Don't jump to conclusions about why God placed you in the sphere you're in, in Manhattan or anywhere else right now, as a Christian, because God put you there to be the light. Amen? So don't jump to conclusions, but hey, I'm not going to do my faith stuff here, because you don't know what God is doing. So don't jump to those conclusions either. Okay, so what's the gospel? What's the good news of the gospel here? Everyone here, how many, okay, now we have a verdict here. How many people here jump to conclusions? Raise your hand, come on. All right, everyone here, okay. Every, so, you're, so tell someone you, you're annoying people. And then you say this, I'm annoying people too. I'm annoying people. Okay. So that means everybody in this room, all of us, are annoying others. So what does that mean for other people to be in relationship with us, our spouse, our friends, our family? They're annoyed. So if, so if you make mistakes and you always jump into conclusions and labeling and even fortune telling, oh, that, you know, I don't want to go to that family gathering. It's going to be a disaster. Or I want to go to that because it's going to be until you, you already know what's going to happen, you know. Uh, what does it mean to be in relationship with us? Uh, I know we like to always project and go, oh, I don't want to be in relationship with that person. You never think about what it means to be in relationship with you. What does that mean? Well, the only way then we can have relationship is what? Read with me. 1 John 4, 18. There is what? 
But perfect what? Love. Because fear has what? The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And then it says God is love. And then it says in Scripture, very clear, 1 Corinthians 13, love is what? Both what? Patient and kind. You want to be in relationship? First, we have to be patient with one another. Directly proportional to how much patience you need from someone else. So we're always screaming at people and yelling at them and telling them, why can't you get it together? you got to first look at yourself and be like, okay, I'm doing the same thing. It, it's, it's, and the word patience in the actual Greek is suffering, long suffering. Tell somebody the long suffering. And you're like, oh, yeah, I know all about suffering with, with people in my life, long suffering. And so we cause suffering. So patience is number one. We need to be patient with one another. We have to slow down and be like, oh, yeah, you're human. You jump to conclusions, so do I. And then what, what, love is both pa patient and what? Second is what? Kind. Why, why is the gospel good news? What do we need more, more than anything else in this planet because of the faulty reasonings and assumptions that we have in our life? We need both patience and kindness. And God is both in perfect confluence. God is both patient and kind. God, the Bible says that God is love. So to the degree you're, you're critical of yourself and you're not very kind to yourself, and this is usually the psychological profile, if you are mean and critical and, and harsh to yourself, you'll, you'll be harsh to others. And then you'll view the world as a hostile place. And you'll fulfill the self-fulfilling prophecy by being hostile to others and nasty, which will damage relationships. But if we enter the gospel story, then we're entering into a narrative where God will be patient with us. Tell someone next you, God is patient with you. And then say, hallelujah. hallelujah. He's not only patient, because I'm patient with my kids. I'm not always kind. I'm like, oh, you know, Josh spills like eight times. Oh, Josh, you spilled eight times. He's like, I am so sorry. I am so sorry, Daddy. Or he pees in the bed. I'm so sorry. I tried my best. But I could not stop it. It was like a river. <laughs> could not stop it. But we have to clean the sheets, the cost of cleaning the sheet, doing the laundry again, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm not always kind when the offenses add up, but the Father continues to forgive, con continues to encourage, continues to walk with us like children. <laughs> In a world where we jump to conclusion and have faulty thinking, I, I can't think of any better news than to have a God that's good. Amen? Let's stand and pray together. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, the Bible says. I wonder why that is. I think that's because a lot of us in this room are so unkind to ourselves first. You're so critical of yourself. You punish yourself for the mistakes you've made in the past and in the present. And so what do you need today more than anything? You need kindness. You need, you need the Father to say, it's okay. To error is to human, but to forgive is divine. That's my calling. It's my role in your life. It's okay if you fell apart. It's okay if you're struggling. I understand. He understands, folks. So today as we pray, we remember that the gospel and the power and the compelling reason the gospel is such good news is because it's not that God doesn't see things in a binary lens, not just through results, it's not utilitarian. It's how much optimization you're causing your life or how well you're performing. But he looks at your story. And if you want to be understood today, because I don't think you can feel loved without being understood. The Father is here. Oh, heart of mine. Why must you stray from 
one so fair. From one so fair. You run away. You run away. And one more time. And one more time. You have to pay the heaviness of needless shame. Oh, heart of mine, come back. Father, in a world that's fortune-telling disaster, labeling people based on outer appearances, and often mind-reading, a lot of our relationships are built on faulty reasoning, apart from really all the evidence we think of the worst of the world and the worst of people and even ourselves. Oh God, today, Father, we need your grace. We need your kindness and patience with us. Thank you so much that you're not like us. So whatever you're going through today, whatever struggle you might have. The good news of the gospel is God is love. And not, not love or how culture loves. It's not a sexy love, not a sentimental love. It's not a feeling of love. It's a verb. It's a commitment to us. No matter what, neither life nor death nor any other power, nor how dramatic we're being, we're being a drama king or queen, no matter how many tears we shed, no matter how annoying we could be, the Father is love to us. He is committed to walk with us. <laughs> In a world where there is no grace or mercy for mistakes, I can't think of any better news today. 
For those of you who are sons and daughters of the Father, come again. Find rest in Him. For those of you seeking, think through how good God is and invite Him into your life. See how freeing it could be. Because that's what the prodigal son did. He came home. And I pray for that moment for you. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. All God's people say, Amen. God bless you. Go in peace. The love of the Father.